I just want to say to everybody, whoever's here, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're healthy. Uh, I'm glad you're busy and you're doing business. And I'm hoping that, uh, you know, things improve. We're lucky to be in New York. And, um, you know, like the governor says, New York's strong. We certainly are. I'm happy to be part of this organization and I'm, I'm happy to be part of this membership. And with our membership are like family. We love you all. And um, with that, I'm going to let NYBB kick off their uh, really informative presentation on uh, buying or selling your business and acquisitions. And uh, I don't know who's going to start first. We have, um, I'll let you guys, why don't I let you guys talk a little bit first about your company, your history, and about each other, who you are, what your backgrounds are. I think, I think it's great to start that out. Let folks get familiar with you that don't know. We do have a lot of folks here that aren't members. And, um, and then you can kick off your presentation. How does that sound? Does that sound? That sounds, that sounds good, Tyler. Can you guys hear me loud and clear? Yeah, I can okay. hear you. Perfect. So, hey, Tyler, I really appreciate this. I just want to extend a huge uh, thank you to the Melville Chamber for allowing us to um, present. Um, you know, a company and give some great information and insights on what, what it takes to grow and, 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 and sell a business. Uh, I, I really enjoyed the time working with you and, and Ted in the, in the business resource committee um, some time back. I mean, the Mel Global Chamber is doing a great job in connecting and reaching out to business owners in the Long Island area. And, you know, I really appreciate you guys keeping your virtual doors open, so to speak, right, with these Zoom meetings and, and, and keeping us connected and being a great resource for the community. Uh, the MRB Group is a proud member of the Melville Chamber. We are based right in Melville, so it makes sense to be part of the Chamber. And uh, Tyler, definitely appreciate all of your, um, your, your, your recommendations and your, your statements about our, about our company. We strive to be a, a, a credible organization with in, integrity and, 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 and great ethics. That's something that we stand by. So um, I really appreciate that. So we, we're going to talk today about you know, how to grow your business, and I'm going to um, introduce my partners in a second. My, my name is uh, Kyle Griffith. If, if Karen, you mind um, advancing the slides. So uh, my, my name is Kyle Griffith. I'm one of the managing partners of the NYBB Group. We are a, a, a boutique merger and acquisitions and business advisory firm based in Melville. We cover the tri-state area. Uh, however, we do have a national footprint with some of our affiliate, affiliations that we are that we are part of. Um, I've been in this business. If Karen, you want to move the slide one up, move the slide up for one more for me. Uh, so I've been in the business for about uh, ten years myself, and um, I'm also a member of the IBBA. Uh, Karen, go for for one more slide. Go back, yeah. So about ten years in the business. I'm um, also sitting on the board of governors for the International Business Brokers Association. Um, I'm pretty much an advocate for the industry, like my colleagues here that that uh, I will be introducing shortly. Uh, we all have different leadership positions in, in the industry. So we strive for per perfection and a lot of other intermediaries, brokers, m and advisors kind of look to us um, you know, as a staple for the community as far as um, business brokerage and m and advisory is, is concerned. Um, Karen, you want to go back a couple slides, three slides back? Um, so go back, go forward one. Thank you. Um, so today we're going to give a, a little bit about our companies. As Tyler suggested, you get more familiar with us and, and what we're about. We're going to talk about COVID and how it's affected M&A. Uh, we're going to talk about the exit strategy. Hopefully you have one and what's, what's your plan, some business value drivers, and how to determine the value of your business. So that's going to be the topics for today. Karen, go one more slide for one more. Okay. Uh, one more. Okay. So we, we service companies in a lower mid-market space. Okay, uh, revenues between 5 and 50 million. Um, and we do have a small business division as well that services franchises and smaller companies up to 5 million. But we are dedicated to low-limit market space as a space that's underserved. So you think of your, your large investment banks work with larger companies and public traded companies. Uh, we, are, we are below them, so to speak, and we are, uh, we are above your day-to-day -day main street business broker that sell your typical delis and, and, and pizzerias and stuff. So there's a uh, a classification of businesses uh, with revenues above 5 million up to about 50 to 100 million that needs our services that we provide. So we help companies, um, help co business owners, you know, sell their company. We help prepare the business for sale. 
and we help them find the right buyer and help them with their timing and so on, who, who should they sell to. So as far as buyers goes, we do have uh, corporate acquisition plans and we help buyers from different backgrounds, from your private equity groups to your uh, financial buyers, to your independent buyers and your strategic and so on. So we work with buyers and sellers all alike. Um, Karen, one more slide, please, forward. I, I want to turn it over to my colleague, go forward. My, co my colleague Lou and Anthony, and they're going to give a little inf information about their background. And then Anthony is going to talk about the COVID and how it's impacted our, our markets, and then we will take it over from there. So Lou, if you, if you mind taking over, please. Excellent. So good morning, everybody. My name is Lou Delaprida. I'm a managing partner and principal at the NYBB Group. I'm also a certified M&A advisor, and I'm licensed as a real estate broker in New York. As Kyle mentioned, uh, we help middle market businesses uh, with exit planning. We help them figure out what the value of their business is. And then we help them, uh, uh, we act as intermediaries, both on the buy and the sell side. Uh, previously, before I joined the firm six years ago, uh, I was the chief operating officer of a medical group here on Long Island that I helped grow through a series of acquisitions. And I've also in the past built uh, insurance and consulting businesses. I presently uh, serve as the co-chairman of the Long Island uh, chapter of the Alliance of Merger and Acquisitions Advisors which is a group that I co-founded with my partner, my fellow partner, Anthony Citrolo. Anthony? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, Anthony Citrolo. Um, so I started the company back in 2003. It seems like yesterday, but uh, we really, I mean, my background is as a CPA. I'm still a CPA. I worked in a big eight accounting firm when there were eight of them. There are only four now. So uh, that's, that's, that gives you an idea of longevity, I guess. Uh, and the company it was Deloitte that I started with. And, uh, uh, but we've been in leadership positions. I'm presently uh, the president of the New York Association of Business Brokers and, uh, and kind of lead the charge there. Uh, really, our, my, my focus and our focus are really are family-owned and privately held businesses. So most of the businesses on Long Island especially are family-owned businesses, privately held companies, and uh, we really focus on them as, as really our core uh, really what our core competency is and also our deliverables are tailored to the folks who have started their company 15 or 20 years ago or five years ago and need either an exit strategy, they need to know what the business is worth, and they may need some help selling that company from an industry standpoint. I mean, we do a lot of HVAC and construction work. We do a lot of healthcare, manufacturing, distribution. We pretty much um, um, are, are agnostic that way, but uh, it's, it's worked out nicely. We have a large team of folks who, uh, who assist us both in the commercial real estate area, as well as um, you know, our trustee assistant, Karen Libby, who's actually put the presentation together. Thank you to Karen. And, um, and uh, let's go now, let's move on. Keep going. Our industry experience is there. And I think uh, when you look at it, we have a lot of different opportunities uh, we, we can handle a lot of different opportunities. We do have a national presence with the Cornerstone International Alliance that permits us to really have a level of expertise in a lot of different areas and also represent clients in all in, in different parts of the country, even overseas. Uh, we are the New York component of that alliance, which has 19 members now and all hand-selected members, pretty, the best of the best in terms of what we do. We're also uh, affiliated with Whitman Business Advisors which uh, does a lot of CPA transition and transactions and uh, also um, works in um, a, a lot of um, uh, consulting and advisory uh, uh, areas. Okay, let's look at really the, the, the whole COVID thing has everybody kind of up in arms. I mean, prior to, um, prior to 2020, uh, really growth was great. I mean, the growth was positive in 2020 on M&A transactions, which is merger and acquisition transactions, sales of family owned and company and, and privately held businesses. Um, and, and, and really everything was going great. There's plenty of money that folks have to invest that private equity firms have to invest. Um, and uh, acquisition was really a popular way for people to grow their business. People would acquire a company, all of a sudden, instead of doing five or $10 million, they were doing 10 or $15 million. Um, the biggest challenge that folks have really, we're really finding quality companies. And, and that's really what, it, what, what was happening in the marketplace. Most transactions really uh, increased the top line of revenue and also increased the bottom line for folks. 
here we are, you know, post COVID and uh, things have changed a lot. There still is plenty of money out there to invest. Just so you know, I was on with several uh, private equity firms that we deal with and they, they are starving for really inventory uh, companies that they can acquire. Uh, but uh, during COVID, about 40% of all transactions, people looking to sell their company were suspended. Uh, about 14% were terminated by the buyer or seller. So you had a real reduction in activity. Next slide. Uh, valuation, what the company is worth, dropped about 14% at an average. Some industries were hit, of course, harder, like if you were in the hospitality world or you were in a rental or leasing business or in a recreation or event business, you were definitely impacted a lot more. There were some gain, some, some, some winners in, in, the, uh, in the whole COVID thing, but uh, they were few and far between for the most part. Even healthcare and medical uh, were down 16%. You really couldn't stop healthcare and medical before this. And then what folks actually got for their existing businesses that were for sale dropped by about 12%. Okay, in some industries, of course, the bottom fell out completely where you couldn't do anything. But that, that's really, you know, basically what has happened. And we have slides that will show different industries. And I'm sure if you're in that situation, you've probably seen that happen as well. We've had many deals that were changed at the last minute in order to get the transaction done. Okay. Um, and the, the really, as we said, the, the, there's really lack of, of inventory out there. If, uh, if anyone is really in the, in the process of considering a sale at a business, now would be a good time to uh, kind of take a look at that, look at the valuation, because uh, as I said, the many, many, many um, opportunities were lost, but also there are many uh, buyers out there who are looking for opportunities. And now I'm going to turn it over to my partner, Lou Delaprida, who's going to talk a little bit about the exit strategy process. Excellent. Thank you, Anthony. So an exit strategy is an entrepreneur's plan to sell their ownership in a company to either investors or to another company. So for example, a business owner may sell it to a third party. They could transfer it to a family member. They could sell it to a management team, do an initial public offering, or liquidate the company outright, which unfortunately is um, something that uh, many industry prognosticators are expecting to happen going forward. Having an exit strategy benefits you in six key ways, right? So first, it gives you peace of mind that you can exit the business profitably. It creates a strategic direction for your business's growth. It creates a smooth transition for your management team and other stakeholders, and it generates a potential income for either retirement or disability. It also reduces or, ref or defers the potential tax impact on your estate, your spouse, or your family. And then lastly, and most importantly, it protects and enhances the value of the business that you worked so hard to build. Okay, I'm just making sure we're on the right slide there. Uh, so as you develop your exit plan, you want to develop an understanding of what drives value in your business and in your industry. And if you look closely at the slide that you see before you, you'll notice that the items are grouped in three key categories, right? So the items that you see there are either growth drivers, they're efficiency drivers, or they're financial drivers. And analyzing what drives value in your company will help you allocate your time, your resources, and your capital to the areas that contribute the most to shareholder value. Now, all of the items that are listed are important, and we don't really have time to go through all of them. Um, some companies, will benefit by improving all of them. Some may just have to focus on a few. But from experience, I could tell you that some key ones to really look at are the net cash flow. Um, valuation, which we'll talk about in the next couple of minutes, is highly impacted by the net cash flow or the EBITDA of a business. Having clean financial statements, since that gives comfort, tremendous comfort to a potential buyer um, that, um, that you've managed the company well, that you're honest and that you have strong character. Uh, building a management team, one of the biggest issues that arise in, in business sales uh, or in M&A is when the business is highly dependent on the owner of the business. And so to the extent that you've built a really good uh, management team and that your company can run even when you're not there, that is, a very, that is very much of a positive value driver. Um, reducing risk in the ways that are shown, uh, when you actually look at the formula, uh, you know, taking the income approach for uh, for valuation. Risk is a very key and important component in the calculation. And then uh, lastly, decreasing customer concentration 
we work a lot with companies in the lower middle market. And one of the things that you find is that often those companies depend uh, to a large extent on a very small number of customers. We've seen companies that rely on one customer uh, and, and others that rely on 10 or less. But to the extent that you can reduce concentration in your business, that is a net positive for you and is something that will drive value for you. Kyle, you're on mute. Thank you. <laughs> so thank you, Lou. So there, there's some factors that affect the, the value of your company. There's some that you have control of and there are others that you don't. Um, the buyers that we work with, they, they look at three things. They want to see, you know, what, what risk is involved that Luke spoke about a little bit before. They want to see uh, what, what growth opportunities that there are as far as growing your company. Okay. And, you know, um, they want to see, okay, what's, what, as far as your cash flow goes, you know, what, what's, what's your cash flow, what, how profitable your company is. Certain things you control, others you can't uh, right now. I mean, no one really knew that was going to have this huge pandemic, right? As far as um, COVID-19 is concerned. Um, most, Clients that come to us, they have a triggering effect. Okay, they either um, they have an illness or they look at most of them look at retire. So you know, at some point you will retire, and there's certain things you can control for externally and internally. Um, you know, some factors that you may want to consider is your key personnel. If you're if you're planning on selling your business, you want to make sure there's someone that's there that can replace you. You don't want to be the the chief cook and bottle washer taking orders and doing inventory and everything yourself. You want to make sure you have some key employees there that actually can run the company or place. So we, what, you know, what's your infrastructure look like? Um, so as far as the internal factors go, that's something you definitely can control. And you can actually, um, as far as what Lou discussed earlier, some value drivers there that you can use to implement and, and grow your company. Uh, next slide, please. So do you know what your, your business is worth? Uh, I like to use the analogy of, you know, every year you, know, you go, to your, go to your doctor and you get a checkup, right? You get a physical. You, you want to take that same approach with your business. You want to know where you're at. You know, you, you, know, you, you have to measure your, the performance of your business. I mean, you, you can't just, you know, run your business in a vacuum or in a bubble. You have to know, you know, how you're doing and how you're performing. So whether you're looking to sell or not, you have to figure out, like what Lou discussed before, like what's your exit strategy? You, 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 you buy you, you or you, you started a business, what's your plan? Are you plan to hold the business? Are you plan on growing the business? What, what, what is your, your goal? So that valuation is actually going to figure out some of the flaws that you may have that you can address, and it may help you to figure out whether you need to sell now or hold and grow. I mean, a lot of times when clients come to us, they want to know what their business is worth, and we give them an indication of what their, their business is worth, but now they have to have that conversation with their CPA to see what their tax, you know, what their tax indication is going to be. And with their financial plan to see, okay, well, you know, I spoke with an intermediary and they said my business is worth $2 million. You know, is that enough to suffice for my retirement? Uh, we, we always recommend, you know, getting a, a formal valuation done from someone that has a CVA, ASA or CBA um, credential. Um, you know, that way you can actually know, you know, a deep dive into your business and know exactly where you're at, where you stand, is to make sure you're not leaving any money on the table. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, as far as determining the value of business, it's more of a, an art than a science. So, I would have to say, prior to COVID, you would probably want to look at your historical sales, and part of that is re recasting your, your, your profit and loss statements and your balance sheets just to reflect, to see exactly what your, your EBITDA is, to see exactly what you earn at the end of the year, right? So we have to go into detail as far as what's involved in the recast, but we want to clean up the financial statements. You want to work with a CFO that can, that can, help, that can help you do that. Uh, what we see now is the discounted cash flow method because we want to see how your business is going to be ramping up over the next 12 months. That's what buyers are really looking at now. Um, you know, it's a lot of uncertainty in the, in, in, in the marketplace. And we don't, you know, you know how you perform three years. So that historical, um, your historical trend can give you an idea, give, give you a baseline, but what's more important coming out of a crisis is how fast you ramp up. And um, we're seeing right now that, you know, forecasting your, your, your revenues and earnings over the next 12 months is what the banks are looking at and what buyers are going to be looking at. So that, that's very important to make sure you get that done. Next slide, please. And um, so I'm going to turn back over to Anthony. I mean, here are some of the, the deals we have done over the years. We have serviced multiple companies in multiple industries. I'll let Anthony talk a little bit more about this. And we're going to get into some case studies that we have had 
in, you know, recently. Thanks, Kyle. Um, so we, we call it the measure of success and we, we kind of span a, a lot of different industries. And uh, I think uh, the one thing that's common in, in all of these is, you know, we, we have family owned businesses, uh, people who built their business typically from the ground up. Sometimes they've acquired it from someone. Sometimes it's the second generation or the third generation. Oftentimes there's not a generational transfer because the next generation is not taking over the business. So I'm gonna just go through one or two cases that were very interesting. We had a refrigeration re repair company, Long Island Base, that was uh, approached by a very large company. Probably it's going back five years now. And um, they weren't looking to sell the company, but uh, stake some, a, a large company, very, it's actually a large public company, came knocking on their door and said, hey, we'd like to buy your company. And they really weren't ready. They weren't ready emotionally. They weren't ready physically, the, their books and records weren't ready. So that didn't happen at that point. They actually hired us to help them go through that process and realize that there were some things that, you know, maybe needed to be addressed prior to uh, a sale. So what they did is they took then, and we helped them, we, they took the next 18 months to really get the business ready. And that included having uh, cleaned up financial statements. Um, there was nothing wrong with their financial statements, but Sometimes um, they, need, um, they need to be put in a format that the acquirer will understand better. Uh, it is interesting to have, um, it's very good to have audited or reviewed financial statements if possible. Um, they had vehicle leases that they cleaned up. Um, some of them had to get paid, some of them had to get extended. They, they did some work with their IT system. They had some customer contracts that they got extended. And this was a, a family owned business, a father and son. and. Uh, uh, finally, what happened was um, they got the business ready, went through excruciating due diligence because the purchaser was a private equity firm. But what happened from the point where they started to the point where they finished, the multiple that they got for the business increased from four to about six. And, and you know, without going through pricing or anything like that, what that means is by doing some very, you know, uh, very uh, careful um, and, and, and calculated changes in the company, um, you, they've actually increased their, their value by a third. And uh, when you talk about a value driver, we talk a lot about value drivers. The value drivers to the buyer a lot of times are good financial statements. They include very good um, uh, management teams. So if you have a management team, you really should have the, the right management team in place and also perhaps have them under some kind of agreement. And uh, this company ended up doing that, and we successfully um, exited uh, the uh, the business. They actually are still running the company, actually, by, which is owned by a private equity firm, and uh, they will be exiting the company probably in the next 12 months. It was a great success story, uh, Long Island-based company um, that that worked well. Uh, the other one I'd like to talk about is a, is a company called Gray Glass, and what we had was a glass company that was uh, manufacturing uh, various types of glass, uh, family owned business as well. Uh, father actually purchased it from somebody who he had worked for, brought his son into the business and brought the son-in-law in the business. And at some point the son-in-law had aged up and wanted to exit the business. So they decided it was time to sell. And what happened was when you look at your business, sometimes your business is not acquire, it's not able to be acquired by just one person because you may do, you may have different lines of business. In this case, they had architectural gla glass that they took care of and they had some specialized glass. So what happened uh, there is they did went through the same process. Uh, the one person who wanted to exit is a CPA. He helped clean up the books for the company. And uh, we ended up having two transactions for that company. One company that bought the architectural part of the glass uh, company and the second one that was purchased by someone who really wanted the specialized part of the glass. Uh, but this takes, this takes some planning. When we talk to people about exit strategies, people say, when should I start planning the exit of my business? And uh, we really say, you know, if possible, when you buy it, you know, it'd be nice to know what the end is in sight. Here's an example, private equity firms, when they buy a company, they know that within five years, typically they want out. They're gonna get out. They're gonna cash out their investment. They're gonna buy it today sell it in five years. So what do they do during those five years? They build the company. They know in five years, they wanna exit the company. If they bought it for, for, uh, for X, 
They want to get two or three times X when they exit the company. So what they do is they improve it. They make acquisitions to uh, enhance uh, the business. They grow the business both organically and through acquisition. And five years from then, they basically provided their investors with uh, a great cash out. And uh, that really is a great process for, uh, for the average business owner to really consider um, what a way they can do the same thing and accomplish the same goals. Kyle, I'll give it back to you. You're on mute. <clears throat> Thank you, Anthony. So, I mean, we, we definitely implement a team approach. Uh, we all have different backgrounds and competencies, and I think we work very, very well together. I think what separates us from, from other companies is, is just that when you, you're not just getting one person that's doing everything. Um, you know, we like to practice what we preach. So we have a, a methodology to our, to our madness here that, that can help facilitate clients from, from the packaging to the preparation to the marketing to the negotiations and facilitating the entire process. So um, Tyler, I really appreciate yourself and Ted for this opportunity to, to present. And um, we want to open it up for any, any questions that, um, that any of the members of the chamber will have for, for us here at MIBB. Thank you, Kyle. That was a, a great presentation, a very informative. Uh, love the, uh, uh, the different scenarios that you showed. Um, so I, if you go into the chat, I wrote a novel. <laughs> just, <laughs> so I, I, I just described the system. For those of you that are not familiar, I'm sure most of you are by now. We've been doing this a while. Uh, everybody has been doing it. So we have a hand raising feature. We have a Q&A on the bottom of the screen and we have a chat. Uh, you can network with each other. You can interact with the panelists. And there's a hand raising feature that I'll also take a look at and we'll put you in the queue. If you want to ask the question verbally and interact with the panelists, you can do that as well. Uh, so I see some Q&A and see we have Todd Ringler some businesses are 20, off 25%, no revenues since March. Others have grown with an, uns, with an uncertain, I guess I have to scroll up. Uh, Economy. I it's there. So I, I don't know if that's a question or a comment, but I guess it's a comment. Uh, and so let, let me turn it into a question. Um, it's how to raise how to reverse that, how to, how to turn that around. Be creative. Kyle? So uh, it, I know Todd wants to, I don't know if that's a statement or a question. I mean, there are a lot of businesses are off 20%. Some are just down 100%, right? So um, if Todd, you want to rephrase that and... Uh, wait, there's more. He, he added that... Uh, uh, I'm not able to read. He wants to know how you're looking at it and calculating business value, okay? Right, right. I that think, I think that's, that's, you know, that's, that's right, the Jeremy. question. Yeah, go ahead, Todd. Yeah, that, that, it, I hit I hit enter in the middle of typing, so I apologize. But yeah, it's you know I, I'm seeing interesting things in this. And this is, by the way, gentlemen, thank you very much. Really informative. I appreciate what you've done and and how you're describing things. But you know, on your slide of you know businesses are down fourteen percent in value. I, I'm seeing very different things depending upon the industries. So what are you looking at when you're calculating value? And I know we talked about, you're talking about discounted cash flow, which may be something abstract to some of the people on this call, but you know, we always talk about a business is worth today, what its future is going to bring based on the past. So I was curious as how you're calculating the values or how you're looking at the value. That was the question. Okay, Anthony, we take that or you got it? Sure. Um, well, that's a good question. I think it, it's very industry, Todd's very industry specific, right? Um, so I, uh, our conversations with the, 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 the acquirers especially are, uh, if, if, you know, the whole COVID thing is not going to have long-term impact on the business, and God bless you if you can have a crystal ball and know that, okay, then um, it would be carved out to a certain extent, as would um, any kind of increase in, in business as a result of the whole COVID thing, because some businesses have benefited. So that's going to be carved out the same way. I think um, they're, going to, they're going to look at what projections look like when they look at the discounted cash flow method, right? They're going to 
see if they make some sense. And um, what's happened is it's really sometimes a restructuring of some of the terms. You're going to see uh, acquirers looking at value and saying, okay, our multiples are pretty much the same and multiples haven't changed that much, but we're going we're gonna to really work on how we pay out that money. So there may be more earnouts, there may be more restructuring of deals that way that are contingent upon uh, future revenue. Uh, but I think uh, if you have somebody who hasn't had revenue since March, clearly it's probably not a good time to go to the market. And clearly you as a valuation person would probably have a tough time even kind of valuing the company, right? We're actually looking at that and saying it's asset value. And, um, you know, it's a liquidity crisis at that point for this company. They're, 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 they're not sure that they're going to be able to come out of this. Um, similar to some restaurants, they're in the entertainment space and they've, they've had nothing. So, you know, what are they supposed to do? But uh, I, Todd, I Todd I'm going to jump in because what you're talking about now is actually something that Susan, our co-chair of our women's group, is making a very good point about. And I think we'll lead into that discussion and give you a better answer. So Susan is saying, can you talk more about the emotional readiness in M&A and also the importance of retaining talent in the process. So that kind of ties in with a little bit of, about what you're saying. Uh, am I correct, Todd? Yes, without a doubt. Without a doubt. No. It, it, it's an interesting conversation because yes, none sir. of us have that crystal ball. And yeah. when I turn my eight ball over, it says try again. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> I, I, think it, I think it's important more than ever to have good professionals and advisors in your team. Um, like I said before, most, entrepreneurs like ourselves or the business owners, you know, we're in a bubble, we work in, we don't know what's going on in the outside world. Um, you definitely want to, you know, have some self care and also reach out. So, I mean, selling a business, it is an emotional roller coaster. I mean, we have been to the closing table and deals is not closed at the closing table. So you can get almost a home run and get tagged out. Right. So, um, and then you just tap out. You decide, you know what, I'm not going through this again. So it, it is a challenge. You want to make sure you have if you're selling a company, have someone that's been there can kind of coach you through the process. We do be, we do become coaches, you know, during the process. You know, it's tough. I had one deal that basically was dead in the water. Um, they serviced the event space, and um, all of a sudden, I mean, we actually let me take it back. The deal was actually about was was we had accepted offer, about to go to due diligence, and then COVID hit. Um, the seller actually decided to put it off, not the buyer. The seller wanted to wait because he figured, okay, probably six months of a down market and, you know, he's going to be able to cash out, you know, on, on the tail end of this. Now, unfortunately, back in March, we didn't know it was going to get this bad. Um, so deal pretty much went dead. And then, you know, he just like, you know what, I don't know if I can go through this anymore. He just went through prostate cancer, having some tough times. Like, you know what, I'm just going to either keep the business or have my son run the business. And then, all of a sudden, we got another buyer that's desperate to buy the business. They have some acts planned. A lot of the artists are doing live streaming events, like big acts. I'm not going to call them names, but some, some big artists in the entertainment space are now streaming their concerts live, and they need bandwidth to handle hundreds of thousands of people, viewers. So now we are back in the saddle again, working the deal. So, you know, it can go back and forth. So, Susan, um, great question, and I would definitely advise that, uh, if you're in that process to consult with someone that can kind of coach you and kind of help you on the emotional side while we can handle the, 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 the other aspects and dealing with the, you know, the, the minutia of, you know, getting deals across the finish line. And if I can chime in as well, um, I think that the, the, the two issues that, you know, were presented, um, you know, emotional, the emotional issues of selling uh, and employee retention, I don't think necessarily have, uh, are exclusively related to the, the COVID pandemic. These are issues that have always plagued uh, M&A transactions and things that always need to be taken into account. There have been numerous books about from business owners. You know, uh, I remember um, I worked for a firm where they wrote a book titled Selling Your Baby. And for most of the people on this call, their business is their baby, right? They, 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 um, they conceived it, they nurtured it, they grew it. And now it's that decision to, you know, to how do I transfer this to someone else? And for some people, all the money in the world will not make that transfer go through because they're concerned not so much about money as they are about, um, you know, their, their legacy, making sure that their employees are, are treated properly, 
and that the company continues to thrive in, into the future. And then there is the issue that Susan raised of um, if you can overcome all those things, then how do you emotionally still pull the trigger? And, and I don't have a, a good answer for that uh, because, again, that, that is one of the, the roadblocks that we have sometimes to doing a deal. No matter how well we, no matter how tight a process we run, no matter how um, much we coach the client, at the end of the day, you're going to run into some business owners that just cannot see themselves out of that business. It often tends to be an octogenarian, somebody in their 80s who has been working in the company 30, 40, 50 years, and they just, and they just can't do it. The issue of um, employee retention is a huge one because you face a couple of challenges, right? M&A, by the way, is all about confidentiality. If you go to sell, let's say, your home or a piece of commercial real estate, you want to tell the whole world that you're selling it. But when you're selling a business, you want to keep it confidential and you don't want anybody to know for all the obvious reasons that that present, right? Well, your employees, though, they see you day in and day out and they know that something's going on. And they're going to want to ask, well, you know, what, what about me? What's going on? Worked for a company actually where, um, you know, my wife worked for a company. She was a chief operating officer of, of a medical group. I worked for the company as well. And every, and they made a series of acquisitions and they grew dramatically and um, they wound up selling the company for a nice multiple. But every time that they made an acquisition, her job was at risk. I also worked um, in, um, I I led an urgent care group, and oftentimes one of the very first things that I would go in, and I was praying that no one would quit on me. None of the doctors, none of the nurses, none of the MAs, none of the none of the um, receptionists. Every single one of them was praying that I wouldn't fire them. And so that's something that that needs to be addressed very early on, uh, so that you can realize the maximum value for your company. So do we have uh, any questions? You're welcome to raise your hands, go into the chat. I'm watching the chat, the Q&A. I do have a question from Hiron. Um, is it possible to acquire a little big company? I like that. It's like a little... <laughs> um, by a company smaller in size, but successful company. So I think what he's trying to articulate is that if you have a really small, successful company, can you actually, as a smaller company, acquire a larger company that has a good synergy with that smaller company? Wow. So, you know, I so think Tyler, that's this is good. Anthony. Um, I think, look, when we say acquisition to folks, there's two real key components, right? I mean, there's a lot of components, but one is the financial capacity to do a transaction and to be able to afford it, okay? And the right. second thing is the manager, managerial capability. Correct. Remember, if you're going to acquire a company that's bigger than you or smaller than you, you know, you have to be able to manage it. There's going to be some, some transition involved. There's culture involved. So could it be done? Yes. And you need to be careful in any acquisition, whether big yeah. buying, small, small buying, big. Yeah. I think, you know, if you're not equipped financially and your managerial team is really not the right fit or then don't do it. But if they are and you do have the money, then do it. We, you know, we always... We, uh, we warn folks who are making acquisitions, especially if it's for the first time, you know, don't really, don't bite off more than you can chew, so to speak, right? So I think That's you correct. have to be careful with that. And um, That's and, correct. Uh, culture is important, <laughs> like you said. But today, don't forget, we are living in a world today uh, when you talk about if you have the funds. Borrowing is, is almost cost-free today. So for, for someone to want to do that, if the culture is right, if all the other pieces fit together, you're probably in the best environment that we've ever been in with regards to funding to do something like that. Am I not correct? Yeah, if, if I may add, so the, the rule of thumb is usually you, you buy a company 25% of your size. If you're doing 10 million, you buy a company that's doing two and a half million. Uh, with that being said, if you're at the point where you have good sophistication, you have good teams in place, you have great infrastructure, well-run company, and you have, you're well capitalized. So one thing is borrowing the money. The other thing, you know, can you afford to pay the note that is going to come in after, you know, that, that the note is due? Um, that, that's the other thing. And then the other aspect of it is usually the other way around because what's going to happen on the acquisitions we have done, if you're approaching a, a bigger company, you know, they want to make sure whoever is buying them is reputable. 
because now we have to explain to their key people and their personnel, you know, who's the, this investor, who's this company. And, you know, if it's a, a company with um, lower standards or not a good synergistic fit or a smaller company don't have resources that the a company being acquired has, then they may be turned off by your approach. But it sounds like, based on his question, he has already engaged with a prospective company, I, I, would, I, would, I would assume. So if you, if you need some more, you know, intel or insight, you know, happy to reach out to us. I, I really <laughs> like the topic of exit only because um, there are a lot of small businesses on Long Island um, where they want to transition uh, and, and keep it in the family. Uh, and, and lots of times there are, uh, there are ways to do that uh, where you want to provide uh, and you want to uh, maintain a legacy. There are, there are legacy businesses. There are, leg there, are, there are folks that want to leave a legacy. We certainly want to keep, if we have a, a business and whether our kids are uh, a part of it or not, we want to try to keep our youth here on Long Island. And I know I see Winnie, Winnie is here, Winnie Benjamin, uh, who works with you guys a lot. Uh, she's great, uh, you know, with regards to that and making sure that, uh, you know, that we, we get bring in these exits where there's a legacy involved. Uh, and, and that's really, I saw Winnie's name and I thought of that because I know she's passionate about that. Uh, so uh, there's somebody else in the uh, queue, I think. No, okay. I so, saw so a question here, Tyler. Um, may I ask Alex to rephrase that? He's asking, are investors ready to invest yet with the proper business plan? Mm-hmm. So if you want to rephrase that, but I can say yes. So there's a lot of dry powder out there, meaning there's a lot of capital out there available. Um, the issue is, is not that many good opportunities. So like Todd was, this was, was mentioned later, a lot of companies are down. So it, 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 it takes away a lot of opportunities that investors would have typically invested on. So what's happening is there's all these sharks that are just competing for, you know, <laughs> this small um, of available supply of, of opportunities and inventory. So that's what's going on. So if you have a good company and you, you survive, and some companies are up, by the way, because of the pandemic, you will get pre, pre-COVID num pre -COVID multiples. Um, however, if you're down, you have to, like what Anthony said and later, earlier on, you may have to consider some earnouts or, you know, selling notes and, and you know, other concessions to make the deal go through. Have you gotten into situations where you have to protect your former prospects or clients from predators like that? When you say, for, what, what do you mean? So, so you have a client or a prospect that uh, you just mentioned the word sharks and they're, they're circling around and they, they see the value in the company, but the, the business owner can't. Yeah, so so what, what's happening is that uh, an investor will try to lock, lock in a client into a deal. So if, you, you know, if you're not advised right, they will send out you know, an, a term sheet or whatever. And, oh, I learned and, all about that on your yeah, uh, you're wonderful uh, evening with that. Uh, so we we have to deal with that a lot. So we have some folks who try to lock up a deal, and they'll have let's say two months to review and do due diligence, and then no other investor can review that opportunity. We have to pretty much take it off the market, right. and you know, so uh, we, yeah, definitely have to be aware of that. Because it was they would pretty shocking. It was pretty shocking to me listening to that attorney and about the verbal use of contract and mm -hmm. how uh, you know you're liable. Uh, just just by talking about it, yeah, yeah. you know that's another topic. To, to <laughs> yeah, well, Kyle, I think what we really recommend to folks is you you need to have the pro you need that proper representation. If you have somebody who's going to uh, uh, help you um, who wants to buy your company, and then you know you you basically want to enter into into an um, arrangement with them, then make sure that you know your T's are crossed, your I's are dotted. You know what the value of your company is. Uh, we tell folks, you know, sometimes they want quality of earnings report. They want different different documents that that will be necessary and different analysis. But you need to know what the expectation would be, and also you don't so you, so basically you don't go through a process and really, as I say, sometimes have a firm grasp on an empty bag. You know, you got to be careful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I also think that I also think that um, sellers need to be proactive about the, when they're going to sell. Right. So there are many sellers in this environment that, you know, um, rightfully have decided to, you know, defer the sale of their company until, until business comes back. But the expectation is um, one that we're, we're moving into more of a, of a buyer's market going forward. And also that, you know, once the, the different monies that have been given by the, you know, through the different government programs and, 
uh, have expired, that certain companies are going to face a, a certain reckoning, right? There are many that may have to sell whether they want to or not. They may need to sell just to, to raise capital to support either their other investments or just to, or just to live on. And the message that I have for anyone that thinks they may find themselves in that situation, uh, you know, three months down the road, six months down the road, is that you really should start to, to look into the process of selling sooner rather than later, because it takes a lot longer than you think to sell a company. And it can also take a meaningful amount of time to prepare the company. But most of all, it actually could take you a little while just to even educate yourself about the process. We went through that process right now in 20 minutes. But I can tell you, you can spend hours speaking with your accountants, your attorneys, and M&A advisors, and still have questions at the end of the day. So the sooner you get started, the better. And the one thing to keep in mind is that just because you explore the possibility of a sale doesn't mean that you actually have to sell or partner with, with anyone. You can go through the process and decide that, you know what, the time is not right. We'll do this, we'll do this later on, and, and there's no problem with that. And just to follow up on Alex and the business plan, um, I just want to rephrase that, but I'm, I'm thinking that, so if you do it, it, if you're new, if it's your first time buying a business and you're planning an SBA lend, and it, it would help to have a business plan. And you know, we have some resources for that. Um, I've actually helped, helped a, a buyer buy a, um, a business in the city and they, they, they had to get a business plan because the, the, the landlord was very strict on who was actually going to be taking over the, 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 the lease. So we had a, we actually had them put together a business plan and a landlord deck, and that that helped in in, in getting this, getting the deal done. Yeah, and the other thing too, by the way, if you're if you're an individual business owner, you have to realize that again, if you're moving into a buyer's market, there are going to be a lot of people looking at that um, same company, and often um, in many of the markets we represent, the buyers are very sophisticated. So they're either you know strategic buyers that are in the same industry as the seller and they have experience making other acquisitions or their financial uh, sponsor type groups, such as fam you know, um, private equity groups and family offices, and they've made a series of acquisitions. So if you've never acquired a business, you not only need to educate yourself on the process, but you need to go through the process of, of figuring out how do you compete against those two other groups? And how do you um, convince a seller to sell the company to you if you don't have experience um, buying a company? And those are also the types of things that different advisors can help you with. Hey Todd, we, we've been doing a lot of consultations over the past few months and lately we just, um, we have a new tool now that we're willing to offer to, to folks here at the chamber. Uh, we have a, it's called an express SWOT analysis. And what it does, it benchmarks your company against other companies in the marketplace, um, comes back with some KPIs and shows you where your strengths and weaknesses are, opportunities and threats and so on. It also gives you indication of value um, and that's something that we are offering back to the community and, and, and businesses that just want to get a feel for where they are so they can make decisions and need to hold and grow their company or, or move on. So that's something we're willing to offer to members of the chamber. What form does that come in? Is it a sheet? Is it a... It's, an, a, it's just a PDF form. It's, it's, it's like about four pages. It's quick. So it's not, you know, sometimes you do, you do evaluation and, and Todd can probably relate to this. Um, you know, the owner just wants to know what the price is, what the numbers is. They don't read the 40, 50 pages of evaluation. So you know it's... What? Send it uh, yeah. with the with this. Send the PowerPoint. Uh, send, email me over the PowerPoint and also that sheet, and I'll add that to our thank you letter. So uh, you all know we send out a thank you email with uh, the uh, contact information of everybody that's on, even the folks that registered that couldn't make it. And we also will send out the PowerPoint with that thank you, and we'll send out that. That's that's a great tool. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop we, a we link in the that. I'll drop a link in it right in the chat so folks can actually go straight to it and see um, get some information. Right. Yeah, and in addition, in case they can't get it off the chat, just send it over to me and I'll put it in the uh, the thank you email. Sure. Where they have it. Looking for some more activity here. Everybody's quiet today. Let's go. Come on. <laughs> hey, babe, this is really great. I I I got to tell you guys, uh, we we have a nice. Uh, we have a nice uh, uh, following that, that came today. Uh, I think you guys are really popular. Uh, just to make you your heads uh, blow up a little bit, this is a record. We have a record registration, and we had a record attendance, and I really think it's primarily due to your popularity, and I think Kyle has, and, and Anthony have been doing some, uh, 
some of your own virtual events. And I think you, you're developing a following. I think they followed you here. <laughs> they, they follow you, Tyler. You and Ted doing a marvelous, marvelous job, you know, keeping the chamber engaged. I mean, um, thank, you. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. And thank you to the chamber. Thank you. We appreciate it. We love doing the work. It's, a, it's not work. It's a passion. Uh, and we love our members. We have such a great culture in our chamber, uh, family type culture. Um, we're getting thank yous here. Thank, thanks much. And yeah, but people saying, oh, I gotta leave, I gotta leave. But we still have, uh, most of the folks are still here. I'm just, I'm just scanning the, to see if there's any more questions or concerns. We're approaching 10 o'clock. We wanna be respectful of everybody's time. So um, any last questions? If there are any more, and aren't any more questions, um, go on our website uh, and, and check, check it uh, for the events coming up. Next week is posted. You can register now. Uh, also, uh, we'll be posting the uh, August events shortly. Uh, we have some new tools, by the way, coming on to the, the website. We're, we're adding a lot of new things to, to our website. We do have an app. We have a mobile app. Um, and we're building, uh, we're building out technology wise. Uh, so uh, to benefit you, we're, we're looking to, uh, be able to get a buy local platform put into the, to the chamber so that we can get our small businesses, uh, valuations up a little bit more. Okay. For you guys. <laughs> okay. That'd be good. Um, so, so with that, I want to thank you so much. Uh, for doing this and I want to thank everybody for attending. This was great. Love it and looking forward to the next one Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tyler. Enjoy, enjoy. You thank you very much. Good rest of the week. Have a great day